Here we have some employee data. It's in a tabular format, which is a great start, but we're going to improve it by formatting it in an Excel table. Now, because this data is contiguous, I can simply select any cell and insert a table. But if your data has empty rows or columns, then it's best to select the whole range before formatting it in a table. To format it as a table, we can go to the Insert tab and then Table, or we can use the shortcut keys Control T. We need to say whether our table has headers. Mine does. If yours doesn't have headers, Excel will insert some headers in the row above your data with the default column numbers, column one, column two, column three, and you can then modify those. I'll click OK. And notice that my data is now formatted in a table with banded rows, and we have filter buttons on each column. We can see the end of the table if I click away from it. It's indicated by this blue sizing handle in the bottom right cell. If I select a cell in the table, the Contextual Table Tools Design tab becomes available. Here we can see the table has been given a default name, Table 6. The first thing you should do is rename the table with something meaningful because this will help you reference the table and its contents later on. We can rename it here simply by click in the field and I'll call it Employees and press enter. By the way, names must be unique in the workbook and they can't contain any spaces. We can also edit the name via the formulas tab and the name manager. So you can see my table is here and we can see the different tables in this file because they're indicated with the table icon. I can double click it to edit the name and make a change there or you can click the edit button. The shortcut key to open the name manager is Control F3, but it's always available from the formulas tab and then name manager. So now that I have my data formatted in a table, I can navigate to it from the name list. And when I select it, it selects the range of data, excluding the header rows. Now I can change the formatting of the table by going to the table tools design tab and then we have a table styles gallery and I can hover over different styles to get a preview of what they look like. You can even create your own table style or a quicker way might be to find a style in the gallery that you like that's close to the colors that you want to use or the formatting and then right click and duplicate. Once you've duplicated that style, you then are able to make some modifications and further customize it. You can even set it as the default style for this document. If you prefer not to have the banded rows, you can simply choose the light setting and it looks like any other Excel worksheet, but we still have our filter buttons at the top. We can toggle them off again via the table tools design tab. So we can deselect filter buttons. We can remove the header row. Now this doesn't remove it. It just hides it. I'll turn it back on. I always have my header row on. It just makes sense to me, but there might be occasions where you want to hide the header row. Let me turn the style back on because then when we choose some of these other options, we get effects like bolding for the first column or bolding for the last column or both. We can turn on banded columns, which might make sense then to turn off banded rows. By the way, we can also format cells within the table like you would any other cell, including date formats, currency formats, and font styles. You want to avoid setting formats for the whole column or the whole row or even the whole sheet because this can make your file unnecessarily large. Instead, just set the formatting to the table area and as the table grows, that formatting will automatically be applied to new rows. And to help you easily select a table column, if you hover your mouse, not on the column header itself, but just partially into the table column header. You see the mouse cursor is a down arrow. And then as I get to the junction between the column header and the actual cell, it changes to the four headed arrow and then slightly lower, then I get the down arrow again. I can click it once to select just the data in the cells and clicking it again includes the header row. If I were to click up here, then it's going to select the whole column and I don't want that. I just want the table. Likewise, you can do the same with a row. And if I click 
in the row label, the two, I get the whole row. But if I click just in the cell, I get just the table row. And I can select the whole table and clicking again includes the headers. So there's some shortcuts to selecting parts of the table so that you can format them. Okay, getting back to the table design tab, we have another option here to turn on the total row. And that will automatically add a sum to the very last column or the very last numeric column in your table. And if I select the cell containing the total, I get a drop down list. It's going to go up because I've got enough room to display it down. But here I can change the aggregation type. So for example, I could choose average and now I have the average salary. Notice in the formula bar that it uses the subtotal function. And the subtotal function is super versatile, allowing us to aggregate the data using these different aggregation methods, including count. We'll just pop it back to sum for now. now. Also from the table tools design tab, we can quickly summarize the data in a pivot table. We can remove duplicates and convert the table back to a regular range, which you might want to do if you have a lot of data or a lot of formulas in your table. Tables can become unwieldy and slow at about 100,000 rows of data if you also have a lot of formulas in the table. When data gets added to a table, three things automatically happen. One, the table formatting is applied to new rows or columns. Two, any formulas are copied down to the new rows, although if there are any cells in the column above the new rows that don't contain the formula or there are inconsistent formulas in the column, then they won't get copied down. And lastly, the range of cells the table refers to adjusts to include that new data. Now, before we add some new data, let's take a look in the name manager at the table cell range. So on the formulas tab, we can open the name manager and here's our table called employees. And we can see the range of cells it relates to. It's relating to the practice data before sheet cells A2 to E20. Notice it doesn't include the header row. And that's because most of the time we want to work with the data underneath the headers, not the headers as well. We can see here the last cell is E20. And I'm just going to turn off the totals. And we'll go to the additional data sheet. And I've got some extra data here. I'm just going to copy it. And we'll go back to our sheet. And then in the very next cell below the last, set, the last row of the table, I'm going to control V to paste the data in. You can see the formatting has been copied down and the sizing handle is now in cell E26. And if we look in the name manager, you will see that the range for the employees table is now ending at E26. So it's updated as I said it would. Now you can also add data manually. So I can either type in a new record. So let's say E67 is our new employee and they started today and they're 45 and they're a male and their salary is 50,000. So that's one way to add a new row of data. We can also press the tab key. So in the very last cell of the table, if I press tab, you can see a new row is added and I could start entering data in there. I can also right click the table and then insert and notice now I can insert table columns to the left, table rows above or table rows below. And we can also delete rows. So delete table rows. We'll get rid of that empty row. We don't need it anymore. So we've looked at adding new rows of data, but the same applies to new columns. So simply typing in a cell in the next column will expand the table. So let's say we're going to give everyone a bonus by typing in the next cell. Now you can see my table has expanded. The banded columns pattern has also continued. And if I scroll down, we can see the last cell in our table is now in column F27. And notice something here. As I scrolled, now my column headers occupy the column labels. And that's a really nice touch with tables because you don't need to freeze panes to keep this header row visible. As you scroll, it will become the column labels. Now, if you didn't want your table to expand, I can control Z to undo. And now I've got my text still there, but my table range hasn't expanded to include it. Now I can easily move columns. We'll select the column and click again to include the header. And then with my mouse just hovering over the edge of the column, 
until the mouse pointer changes to the four headed arrow, I just left click and drag. And notice the green markers showing me where it's going to insert the column. It's not going to paste it over the top of any columns, it simply moves it. Just be careful doing that because if you don't select the column header and just try and move the data, then it will paste it over the top. You can see there it's going to paste it over the top of my gender labels. So I'll leave that there. I'll click again to select all of it and I'm going to drag it back to where it was. And the same can be done with rows. So I can select a row and then you can see it's going to be inserted where I let go. Now, if for whatever reason your table doesn't resize automatically, you can manually adjust it via the Table Tools Design tab, and then over here on the left, Resize Table. And we can select a new range or simply type in the new cell reference there. Mine's correctly sized, so I'm going to cancel out of that. We can also just grab the sizing handle. See when the mouse pointer changes to a two-headed arrow, I can resize it manually if I need to and add a new row. I'm going to Control Z to undo that. Okay. Now this automatic resizing of the table is one of the reasons tables are so powerful. For example, if you build a pivot table from data stored in a table, you'll never need to update the pivot table source data range again. So here I've got a pivot table and if I added new data to my source, normally I'd have to go up to the Analyze tab, click on Change Data Source. In here I'd have to put in my new table range, but you can see here it's actually referencing the table name. And as we know, when we add new data to the table, it automatically grows. So let me show you. I'll close down this pane so I have a bit more room. I'm going to copy this data. Now my pivot table source data is this table here. I'm going to paste the new data on the bottom. So now we have up to row 26. And if I go to my pivot table, keep an eye on the grand total figures. I'm going to right click and refresh. And my pivot table has updated. So that's a big time saver. Referencing tables gives your workbooks a dynamic named range without actually having to manually build them with formulas like we typically would. And if we had multiple pivot tables that all picked up this data, then we could refresh them all by going to the data tab and then clicking refresh all. Because they're all referencing a table and the table range automatically grows, all we have to do is click the refresh button once and they're all up to date. And formulas linked to a table are even better because they don't require a refresh to automatically update. Okay, it's your turn to get familiar with inserting tables, formatting them, edit the table names and see how they respond when you add some new data.